Good morning. Praise the Lord, everybody. I hope that you all are doing well. We're going to go ahead and record this sermon for you all. Uh, we're doing, uh, still continuing doing uh, Bible study type uh, lessons for Wednesday night. Uh, tonight is going to be the individual temple of God. And we're going to discuss what is the individual temple of God and what that means for us today as Christian. And why it is so important that we are very uh, careful in how we conduct ourselves. Dear Lord, I just pray that you would bless this uh, Bible study tonight, Lord Jesus. Lord, that you would bless us, that you would encourage us, that you would strengthen us, that, Lord, you would help us, Lord Jesus, to grow closer to you every day. Lord, that you would have your way in our lives. Lord, I pray for those out there, Lord, that are hurting, that are sick, that are depressed, Lord, that are coming up against battles, Lord, that they don't know where to turn. Lord, I pray that your word would go forth, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray for those that tune into this, Lord Jesus, into this message, that are sa saved already, Lord that this message will have an impact, Lord, that it will help them to reaffirm why they do the things they do and why they believe what they believe, Lord Jesus. Because, Lord, we want to uh, give ourselves completely and wholly over to you, Lord, that your will might be done. Lord, I thank you and praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. It's a beautiful day. We've been blessed with some great weather. Um, I'm just excited for what God is doing. I'm excited for how God is leading and guiding and the things that he is opening up and how he is working. Um, he has done so much that I cannot tell at all. Uh, if you would turn to your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, very simply put, we are to live a holy life. We are not to base what is considered morally right or wholly off what the world does, because the world is continually changing their moral standard. We are to take what the Word of God gives us as our basis for what is holy, what is righteous, what is modest, what is morally correct. And we can find that within the Word of God. The world is not going to be your moral compass. The world continually changes. The world is waxing worse and worse. And so many churches are waxing worse and worse out there that are embracing ideologies that are in direct conflict with what the Word of God says. And we know that that can't be because God has changed. It doesn't mean that they could have had some great revelation that it was wrong because the Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 through 20. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two saith he shall be one flesh? But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In other words, how we dress and how our spirit is, our attitude, our action, all of these things are part of what goes into being holy and righteous and modest. And it's through the Holy Ghost which lives within us that leads and guides us. Now, we have the ability to ignore the direction and directing of the Holy Spirit. Because God does not force us. He gives us free will. Uh, if you reject the leading and guidance of that Holy Spirit and what it's trying to teach and, and help you to grow, then soon you will find that that Holy Ghost is no longer residing inside of you. And you will have to get a refill of that Holy Ghost in order to uh, receive it back in you like you had. 
Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. When we invite Jesus Christ into our lives, and when we ask for the Holy Ghost to fill us up, we are saying that we are submitting ourselves to the will of God, that we want him to be at most in us. We want him to fill us. We want him to be what our life is about. We want to reject the things of this world. We live in this world, but we are not of this world. Now, although the omnipresent spirit of God fills the universe, God's ultimate desire is to dwell within his people. He communed with the patriarchs as they built altars for worship, and he appeared to Abram on the plains as a theophany. He went before Israel as a pillar of cloud and fire. And when the people of Israel came near Sinai, they built a tabernacle in the wilderness to provide God a dwelling place. And then later Solomon was responsible for building that magnificent temple. Now, the tabernacle provided a central place for the people to worship Jehovah, and the tribes of Israel camped on all four sides of it. Solomon built a temple in Jerusalem, providing a central place for all of Israel to come and to worship God. Now, God provided a strict set of guidelines by which Israel could approach him in both the tabernacle and the temple. He gave Moses detailed instructions on how to construct the tabernacle and all the furnishings within. The Lord also included instructions regarding the priestly garments and the patterns they were to follow for their sacrifices and burnt offering. Now, if they did not adhere to these explicit instructions, God would not receive their offering. Moreover, under certain situations, the punishment for not following after these guidelines was a swift and sure death. Now, the Mosaic law provided types and shadows of that which was to follow after Calvary ushered in the grace dispensation. We are now in that grace dispensation. Now, both the tabernacle and the temple protected the holy presence of God. Behind the veil and the holy of holy sat the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. Now, the Shekinah glory of God dwelt in that small room. When Jesus died, that veil that separated the Holy of Holies was rent into two parts, signifying the fact that now everyone had access to God if he follows the scriptural approach. Now, someone that's lost and knows nothing about God, if they just cry out to God, he is going to receive that call and he is going to give them a way to get the information they need in order to be saved. Now, since the day of Pentecost, God no longer dwells in just buildings made of badger skins or stone and lumber. His abode is now within our hearts. Our bodies are his temples. And he continues to live within the hearts of believers who have obeyed the scriptures. Christ in us, the hope of glory, is certainly a great treasure freely given to every believer. And although we did not deserve this gift, he has filled us with his spirit because he has of his unmerited favor towards us. Amen. We no longer have to visit a geographical place to come close to God, yet there are people that every year travel thousands of miles and spend lots and lots of money so that they can be in a certain place so they can feel in their heart that they are closer to God. And that is a humanistic thought process. They are not required to go to a certain place. We can meet God in our closet at home. God will meet you in your car while you're driving down the road. God will meet you where you are. And he will transform your life by the renewing of your mind. Amen. Now, in the days of his flesh, Jesus prevailed over sin, disease, and spiritual maladies. He forgave sin. He cleansed lepers and raised the dead. He delivered mankind from demonic possession and religious ritualism. Too many churches today are stuck in religious ritualism. It does not matter whether you're Baptist, Assembly of God, Methodist, Nazarene, Apostolic. It does not matter the denomination. There are many within each of these church organizations that are hopelessly mired in religious tradition. 
and not the things that they should be uh, consumed with, which are the things of God and not those things of man. You see, too many places have become more concerned with pleasing man and, and following man rather than following God. We must make sure that what we follow is after the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Follow the guidance and the leading of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Make sure that those that are your uh, spiritual mentors have a great relationship with God. Moreover, we are commanded that we are living epistles to cause others to report that we have been with Jesus. In other words, we're to be his living representation. We're his witnesses. Amen. God fills the universe and beyond to distances that are only known to him. NASA can go wherever they want. They will never be able to reach into the heavenly areas that Jesus is at. They cannot get into those places, nor can they understand them. Psalms 139.7 says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? In other words, there is no place we can go that we can hide from the presence of God. Oh, when, when, when judgment day comes, you're going to have people that are going to try to flee. They're going to try to hide in underground bunkers. They're going to try to do all these things. There is no place you can hide from God. We cannot go where he cannot find us or see us, for heaven is his throne and the earth his footstool. The ancient peoples placed burnt offerings upon altars seeking to communicate with their creator. Righteous men such as Abraham and Isaac heard from God at various times during their lives. God even visited Abraham in his tent on the plains of Mamre. Jacob dreamed of a ladder that reached to heaven and he named the place Bethel which means house of God. However, God had no central dwelling place during those centuries. He called Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. During that journey, they came near to Mount Sinai where Moses went up. He went up into the mountains. He received the Ten Commandments and the pattern for what the tabernacle was to look like in the wilderness. And this tabernacle was to be the central dwelling place for Jehovah. Exodus chapter 25 verses 8 through 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof even so shall ye make it. God desired a place where he could communicate with his people. A place consecrated to him and preserved for that specific purpose. To the eye, the tabernacle was not beautiful on the outside. The grandeur and beauty was the holy presence of God inside the holy of holies where rested the Ark of the Covenant. Let me tell you, you can look at women and, and men out there that will do all these different things to make themselves up, to make themselves look great on the outside. They'll put on their makeup and their jewelry and their fancy clothes. The men will work out all day long and get their muscles and they'll do whatever it is that they want to make their hair just right and get their face micro debrased or whatever they do. I ain't even sure. But they do all these things to satisfy their own vanity because you're trying to make yourself look a certain way on the outside so that you feel that you're beautiful, so that you feel that you're handsome, so that you appeal to those around you. We have our focus wrong because what we are supposed to make sure is that we are appealing to the Holy Ghost. He resides within us. It is what our inside looks like that matters more than what the outside looks like. Now, that's not to say that there is not incorrect ways to look. Being immodest is not correct. Just like having the wrong spirit or attitude in your heart is still not correct. We must be purified and, and, and holy and righteous on the inside, and the outside will come to that same uh, direction. You see, you can not have the inside be right and the outside still desire to be wrong. But you can have the outside look the part while the inside is still a seething pot of sin. 
make sure that you have yourself in the right frame of mind. Quit making excuses for why you don't do this or why you can't do this or why this is not really relevant and, and things like that. Read the word of God. Read what it says. Allow the Holy Spirit that lives within you to speak to you. And when it convicts you, listen to it. When it chastens you, hear its advice heed the warning because if you reject the conviction spirit you feel or the chastening that you receive soon you'll find that the holy ghost departs from you and you won't receive those same thing you do not want to sear your conscience so that the holy ghost can no longer speak to you now the shekinah glory of God came into that room while the priest ministered unto the Lord. Many years later, Solomon built a temple that was magnificent. At its dedication, God was pleased and his glory filled the temple so much so that the priest could not even minister. Both the tabernacle and the temple provided a central dwelling place for God. Now the King James translators use the word temple for two different Greek words. Heron and Neos. The word Heron means the world, the whole of the sacred enclosure, outer courts, porches, and other buildings that are part of the temple complex. The other word, Neos, refers to the Holy of Holies, the holy place. Now, after our personal Pentecost, our bodies become the temple of the Holy Ghost. God no longer dwells in the buildings made with hands but he dwells within our soul. Let's look at Acts 17, verse 24. Acts 17, 24 says, God, made the God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hand. In other words, he now resides within our hearts. Amen. When Jesus declared it is finished, the veil in the temple of Jerusalem was rent into two parts, signifying the opening of the Holy of Holies to more than just a few select in the priesthood. During the dispensation of the law, the priests, the only ones who could go behind the veil, had to adhere to specific instruction or God would judge and kill them. God cautioned them, stay back because their sin separated them from God. Now after Calvary, that veil was rent in twain, and mercy opened the door to the Holy of Holies. Jesus shed blood, sprinkled upon the mercy seat, has remitted our sin, and we can now approach him without fear of judgment. Now his presence is no longer in a specific geographic location or in magnificent cathedrals, but it is in the very hearts of his children. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. It says, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? We are his. He bought us with the price, the price of his blood shed at Calvary. When Moses directed the builders to erect the tabernacle in the wilderness, they placed it in the center of the twelve tribes, with three tribes on each of the four sides. This way, no one tribe had easier access than the other to God. God wanted it readily accessible to all. Now, when Jeroboam became king after the division of Israel, he tried to appeal to the people by setting up places to worship in different areas, by making places in the north and to the south. And this was contrary to God's instruction. Now, when both the tabernacle and temple were completed, God dwelt there. He manifested himself in the glory cloud. Exodus chapter 40 and verse 33 through 34. Exodus chapter 40, verse 33 and 34 says... 
And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Verse 35 says that Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Man, when the glory of God fills us as his temple of God, as his tabernacle, when the glory of the Holy Ghost fills us up, we want to do all that we can do to live for God with all of our heart, soul, mind, strength. Amen. Hallelujah. He directed Moses to build everything according to the pattern. And when it was finished, God moved inside to signify that he was pleased. At the temple dedication and Solomon's pleasing prayer to the Lord, the glory of God filled the house to such an extent the priest could not minister. You can read more about that in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. When we repent of our sin, we are preparing a place for God to dwell. Since he requires a clean environment, we must clean up our lives through godly sorrow and repentance. A broken and contrite spirit. Repentance does not mean that you're sorry that you got caught. Repentance does not mean that, that you feel a temporary moment of guilt. Repentance means that one turns themselves around and walks in a completely different direction. When we feel regret for hurting God through our words, deeds, and attitudes, we are on the road to repentance. It is not just turning over a new leaf or making a resolution or a, a reformation. Repentance is a revolutionary experience where God takes out our cold, stony heart and replaces them with a heart of flesh. Following that change, water baptism in the name of Jesus remits our sin. That means they're paid and bought. We don't have to worry about them. And following true repentance, a person should receive that promised infilling of the Holy Ghost. When you have completely repented of all your sins in sincerity, and you've been baptized in Jesus' name, and all of your sins have been preciously washed away, and you sincerely seek the Holy Ghost, you should receive that because it is a requirement for entering heaven. The initial evidence of this indwelling in the repentant person is that they speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, before repentance, our sin separated us from God so that we could not become a holy temple for the Holy Ghost. Now, after setting this, after settling that sin question, the believer now can approach the throne of God in prayer and have access to him. Prayer, the language of the believer, is the avenue of communication with God where no guilt or condemnation enters. Amen. The woman at the well thought that it was necessary to go to a certain mountain to pray or to travel to Jerusalem. Let's look at John chapter 4 and verse 20. It says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Now she was still looking at things in the eyes of the old way. Jesus told her, though, that an hour was coming when people would worship differently. Verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If you're not worshiping him in the Holy Ghost, you're not truly worshiping him. And you have to worship him in truth. You cannot have false religion and false doctrine in your life. Amen. Furthermore, he told her that she could drink living water where she would never thirst again. When the hour came, people would be the temples of the Holy Ghost, and it would be like an overflowing well gushing up with life. John chapter 4, verse 14, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him never shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Hallelujah. Let's look at John chapter 7. In verse 38 and 39, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. In other words, Jesus had to be glorified before the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost could be given and fill them all. Amen. That is what he was speaking of here. 
Now in the Old Testament, God's presence was inside both the tabernacle in the wilderness and the temple in Jerusalem. The Bible compares the Spirit of God to a dove, and one can easily grieve him. God will not allow the contamination of his spirit with evil, nor will he remain where an individual does not want him. It is possible to grieve the Spirit of God through apathy and carelessness. Indeed, we should carefully protect his presence in our life. That's why we should communicate daily with it, speaking and allowing the Holy Ghost to flow from us daily. Because he loved us so much, God has blessed us by freely allowing us to be the temples of his holy presence. Paul wrote about this wonderful treasure that we possess in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The Holy Ghost in us. We're the earthen vessel. And a treasure is something that we should guard with a diligence by keeping it safe. We do not separate ourselves from the world because we are afraid someone will steal our treasure. We live in this world, but we are not of this world. It is our responsibility to tell others about this precious treasure that we have so that they also may receive it. By giving our testimony and sharing the good news about the Lord, we inspire others to desire it as we do. We should not hoard it. We should not keep it to ourselves. We have re freely received it, and we should freely give to others the understanding and knowledge of what they can have. Now, we cannot give them the Holy Ghost, but we can tell them how they can receive it for themselves. When the Ark of the Covenant was stolen during Samuel's life, when he was young, the enemy placed it in the Temple of Dagon, and the idol could not stay in his place because of the presence of God there. In 1 Samuel 5, God had said, Thou shalt see no other gods before me, or thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the presence of God did not mingle with the idolatry of the Philistine. <clears throat> Excuse me. Spiritual maintenance. When the Lord fills us with his spirit, he intends to abide with us forever. He did not plan to just be there temporarily, but he intended to take up permanent residence in us. John 14 verse 16 says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that, you may abide with, that he may abide with you forever. Spiritual maintenance is necessary to keep ourselves pure and unspotted from sin in the world. Our old nature will seek to rear its ugly head and lust after the pleasures of sin. Paul admonished the young man Timothy to flee these temptations and fleshly desires in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. James declared that a person is tempted when he allows his own lust to entice him and draw him away. James chapter 1, verse 14. Often we like to blame Satan and say, well, Satan tempted me and Satan did this and Satan did that. But it's our own human flesh and our own desires and lust that draws us away. You see, Satan will, will react to how he sees us acting. In Matthew 7, 20, it says, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So the initial evidence of having received the Holy Ghost is when we speak in tongue. But further evidence appears through the fruit of the spirits. What are the fruit of the spirits you have operating in your life? Can others visibly see them at work? Can they see that you are working the fruits of the Spirit? Amen. The Christian life is a growing experience. We don't just get baptized. We don't just repent. And we don't just get the Holy Ghost and then that's it and we're done. We don't have to do anything else. As a Christian, we continually grow. And our salvation process is ongoing. It's not once saved, always saved. You must continually work through your salvation. Amen. We start out as babes in Christ. The conversion experience is a miracle of the moment, but living for God is a lifetime experience of growing into perfection and conforming to his image. See Ephesians chapter 2 verse 21 through 22. This growth is part of the process of keeping our temples clean to provide a clean and holy dwelling place for God. Paul wrote extensively to the Corinthians about the sins of fornication and adultery, admonishing believers to avoid these fleshy tendencies and not to defile the temple of the Holy Ghost. If we defile our bodies by engaging in such practices, we are indeed defiling the temple of God. 
At the end of this, I'm going to read off a list of scriptures. I would greatly encourage you to go and read these scriptures and do further and deeper study of what this Bible study is. Now, the Holy Spirit should saturate your life. If the enemy and the world try to pressure and squeeze us like a sponge, hopefully they will see and feel the Spirit of God within us. Our words, our lifestyle, and our appearance should reflect the Holy God that dwells within us. Indeed, holiness is both inward and outward. We should not love this world or the things that are in it, nor allow ourselves to be overcome with the spirits of lust, greed, and covetousness, or the pride of life that are so prevalent in our society. Our conversation speaks volumes about us because our words originate within us. Jesus indicated that if we talk long enough, others will know the content of our heart. Amen. That's Matthew 12, 34-37. Our society heralds the so-called alternative lifestyles as innocuous and harmless. We should remember that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of these devious practices. Homosexuality is a filthy lifestyle that rebels against the purity and godliness and destroys both the body and soul. It destroys the very life that is ongoing. Through this style of lifestyle, life cannot continue and it's an unnatural lifestyle. It is repeated over and over, both in the Old and the New Testament. It is a lifestyle that does not live according to the Word of God. Now, is it the only way uh, of sin? No. But it is one that greatly grieves the Spirit of God. Murder, sexual immorality of every kind. Uh, lustful thoughts, greed, pride, all of these are horrible sins that separate you from God and will lead to you spending an eternity in hell, lest you repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, and get filled with the Holy Ghost and change the way that you live. The good things of God should permeate our spirits and attitudes. The Apostle Paul listed a group of attributes that we should think to keep our thoughts right. It is my favorite verse. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. If you've heard me preach before, you've heard me use this scripture many times. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. You can figure out in life how to dress, how to talk, how to act, how to treat others, how to speak. Anything that you need to know, you can get with that verse right there. If it does not align with one of those things, then it should not be in our life. Amen? Our thoughts will eventually translate into our actions. In other words, what your real thoughts are, at some point, they will come out. So we must keep our thoughts right to live in a way that's pleasing to the Lord as his temples. The Holy Ghost will lead us and guide our lives in paths of righteousness so that we can grow in grace and knowledge. Therefore, we should honor our bodies and seek to glorify God through our lives. We are to be responsible stewards of this treasure that we possess. Paul reminded us, that we are no longer belonging to ourselves. We yielded ownership at the altar when we said, Lord, I am sorry. Forgive me of my sin. Lord, I want you to be the head of my life. We succeed. We succeeded our control over to the Almighty God so that he could lead us and guide us. Amen. Read about that in Romans 12.1. Jesus demonstrated his deity in many ways, including his power over sin, disease, and spiritual sickness. Many of those in his hometown had trouble to believe that he was more than just a man. He was just the son of Mary and Joseph, even though he showed his power over sin several times by forgiving individuals of their sin, his power over incurable disease. Deliverance from some sins may seem impossible to the human mind, but there is nothing that God cannot do for us. 
God can deliver the drug addict or the alcoholic. He could take the lowest sin sinner and cleanse them by his blood. The scriptures declare that we are living epistles. Many people will not go to a church, but we influence their lives daily as they watch us. A sign on the exit of a church parking lot read, You are now entering the harvest field. The world all around us is a great field ready for harvest. People that are looking for answers. People that are looking for peace in this chaos around us. Outside the walls of our churches is where God intended nearly all of our evangelism to take place. Just as people took note that the disciples had been with Jesus, they are observing us today. The followers of Jesus were first called Christians at Antioch because they reminded people of Christ. Jesus commanded us to let our light shine, to be a city set upon a hill. Our responsibility is not to bring a reproach upon the name of the Lord, but our bodies should glorify God and draw people to him. Our testimony and holy living will allow the world to see Jesus in us. We want to show them a place where they can find refuge for their souls. They're hurting. They need to know where to turn for the answers to the problems of this life and how to prepare for eternity. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. To reconcile people is to help them to settle their differences. God could not dwell in mankind because of sin. So he assists people by leading them to obey the gospel so that they can be reconciled to God. We ourselves cannot reconcile them. Your priest, your pastor cannot reconcile you to God, but they can take you to the place to where you need to be to be reconciled. They can show you what the word of God says and show you the path to reconciliation. The Great Commission instructed us to take the gospel into the world. We are to be willing witnesses to the lost and dying, explaining to them how to escape the wrath of God that is soon coming. In Romans 10, 14, how shall they hear if we do not tell them? 1 Corinthians 1, 21, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Our preaching, pastor's preaching, the word being preached is the way to save souls. The world looks at us as foolish. They look at us as simple. Yet they fail to realize that we have truth. And a very real God is coming back one day very soon. The early church filled Jerusalem with the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Let us also fill our world as individual temples of the Holy Ghost with a saving gospel of Jesus Christ today. The purpose of the church is to fulfill Christ's mission to evangelize the world. We are seeking to show people how to find God and to grow into spiritual maturity as habitations for God. It is fantastic to experience the miracle of this new birth, but we should also seek to live a holy life so we can be ready for his soon coming. We want our garments white and spotless, without blemish. He has no hands or voice but ours, so we should share the good news with everyone within our sphere of influence. We should protect the holy presence of God by living overcoming lives. God desires a place to live, namely in our bodies. However, he will only reside there if we maintain a holy place for him. If you're not living a life holy and righteous before the Lord, the Holy Ghost will not remain inside. It will not be able to stay there because it cannot remain where there is sin abounding. Excuse me. Uh, my throat was getting just a little dry. Now I want to give you some scripture verses so you can go and do a little more study. And get even more in depth with why it's important for us to live holy and righteous. To allow ourselves to be holy. We were declared that we must be holy for he is holy. So let's look at these or let's read off these scriptures so you can write them down. Psalms chapter 139 verse 7. Exodus chapter 25 verse 8 through 9. Acts chapter 17 verse 24, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, chapter 3, verse 17, and chapter 1, verse 21. 
Exodus chapter 40, verses 33 and 34. And chapter 25, verse 9. First Kings, chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. John, chapter 4, verse 14, verse 20, and verse 24. And John, chapter 7, verse 38 and 39. Ezekiel chapter 47 verse 1. 1 John chapter 3 verse 1. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7. And chapter 5 verse 19. 1 Samuel chapter 5 verses 1 through 4. John chapter 17 verses 15 and 16. John chapter 14 verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 11. James chapter 1 verse 14. Matthew chapter 7 verse 20 chapter 12 verse 34 through 37 Ephesians chapter 2 verse 21 and 22 Romans chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 Romans chapter 12 verse 1 Romans chapter 10 verse 14. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. Mark chapter 2 verse 10 and 11. Acts chapter 4 verse 13. Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 15. And then... Um, we have Rome, uh, first Corinthians chapter six, 15 through 20. Okay. Take some time, pray before you begin to study it. Ask God to further open your eyes to understand what these scriptures say. May the Lord go with you and richly bless you the rest of this week. We look forward to meeting once again with you on Sunday. May the Lord bless you. May he lead and guide you. May he open your heart up even more so. We should desire the things of God to be holy and righteous in Jesus so that the Holy Ghost can be at work and alive and well within our soul because we are the temple of God. Dear Lord, I pray that you would bless us, that you would strengthen us, that you would encourage us with your word. Lord, help us to further study your word daily, Lord Jesus, that you might minister to us and encourage us and strengthen us. Lord, I pray that you would have your hand upon all those that are watching, Lord Jesus. Lord, minister to their hearts, Lord. Give them, Lord, the answers that they are seeking. And Lord, I pray that you would just bring us back safely on Sunday. Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go forth and be blessed in Jesus' name precious name.